Okay, am I audible to all? Yes, you are, sir. All right. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Ashutosh, for the introduction and for inviting me to this seminar series. I'm absolutely de delighted to be a part of it. So uh, I have a small group, of colloids and polymer physics group here at IIT Kanpur, where we are trying to understand um, several fundamental aspects of materials such as soft matter, colloids and polymers, etc. And we have a very specific focus on artificial micro swimmers. And in this particular talk, I'm going to um, talk about our latest investigation on active droplets in polymer solutions. So when we think of, uh, just a minute. All right, so when we think of micro swimmers, probably the first image that pops in our mind is something like this. Uh, let me switch on the pointer. Yeah, something like this. He is Michael Phelps, by the way, uh, who is one of the most celebrated um, athlete in the history of Olympics. But my focus for today's talk is not for a swimmer like this, rather on these micron length scale uh, swimmers, such as these biological micro swimmers. So on the left, we have Volvox, which is an algae. And on the right, we have E. coli, which is a very, very commonly known bacteria. Now, the major difference between these two swimmers is their length scale. The former is of the order of few meters, but these biological swimmers are, as I mentioned, is an order of micron length scale. Okay. Now, the difference between their length scale actually leads to a huge difference in the swimming strategies that uh, has evolved as that nature has provided them actually. And that difference can be characterized based on a very popular non-dimensionalized number known as Reynolds number, which allows us to compare the effect of inertia in the system with respect to the viscous drag in the system. All right? So for macro swimmers like Michael Phelps, the typical Reynolds number associated with their motion or the swimming is significantly larger than one. Whereas for the biological micro swimmers, because of their small length scale, the Reynolds number associated with their motion is very, very less than one, okay? And the fact that the Reynolds number is very small, that makes their swimming extremely difficult. And that was explained uh, using Scallop's theorem long back, where it was suggested that at low Reynolds number, since we have the issue of flow reversibility, as a result, if any micro swimmer attempts to swim, using repeated symmetric mechanical stroke, such as this flap is going forward and backward in a symmetric manner, there will be no net motion that will be generated in the flow, in the fluid because of the low Reynolds number leading to flow reversibility. And as a consequence, one cannot swim using a repeated symmetric mechanical stroke, right? So what is the solution to this and how biological swimmers are able to overcome this problem, despite being the fact that they have to swim at very low Reynolds number, okay? The solution which the nature has provided them is to break the symmetry in their mechanical strokes, all right? So for example, paramecium have this uh, small micron scale uh, hair-like structure all over its body known as cilia. And when paramecium tries to swim, the way the cilia beats is such that the forward stroke and the backward stroke are asymmetric in nature. So if the forward stroke is like this, then the backward stroke is something like this. So this way, uh, the cilia breaks the symmetry in moving and hence these micros, the paramecium is able to swim forward or backward. Right. Euglena, as you can see, uh, undergoes a very complex shape deformation. And through that, it breaks the symmetry and moves uh, forward or backward. E. coli has a bundle of these hair-like structures attached to its rear end of the body known as um, flagella. And the way E. coli moves is that it rotates the bundle of flagella in a screw-like pattern and it breaks the symmetry again and the E. coli is able to move forward and backward. So the key idea is that these biological micro swimmers break the symmetry in their mechanical motion and that leads to a net propulsion in the forward or backward direction. 
uh, I would also request audience to please stop me in between if uh, I would if I can explain something better. Okay. Now these biological swimmers also extract energy from their surrounding, and in doing so, they are able to overcome the Brownian displacements, and hence we see a net propulsion in these biological micro swimmers. Right. So now once we have the understanding of how these biological micro swimmers are able to propel themselves. Over the years, what researchers have done is that they have tried to mimic this biological uh, motion by synthesizing artificial micro swimmers. Right? And there are two categories of micro swimmers. One are mechanical micro swimmers, artificial mechanical micro swimmers or microbots as we call them. And the others are artificial chemical micro swimmers. So in mechanical micro motors, we have some sort of a complex shape a complex shaped micro robot and when we apply some external field such as electrical field or magnetic field that micro bot uh, moves and the movement is such that again it breaks the symmetry and the micro bot is able to propel itself but focus for today's talk is on artificial chemical micro swimmers and the principle again is that somehow we need to synthesize these micro swimmers which are able to consume energy from their surrounding and then they are able to move autonomously without the application of any external force and in doing so they need to have a mechanism somehow that they are able to break the symmetry and since these are not they do not have actual mechanical parts which are attached to their surface so they have to break the symmetry in terms of their interactions with the surrounding and i'll elaborate more as we go along there are two very commonly used chemical micro motors first ones are active genus colloids these genus colloids are nothing but simple colloidal particles which have more than one chemical functionality on their surface so for example these the left the video on the left one shows these are silica platinum genus colloids the bright side is silica and the black darker side is platinum genus colloids and then once we have a suitable environment these genus colloids interact asymmetrically with their surrounding and hence they break the symmetry and the particles are able to propel themselves okay the next one and the focus of today's talk is on active droplets these are isotropic liquid droplets of one fluid in another immiscible fluid and they also need some sort of mechanism to break the symmetry and i'm going to elaborate on that in upcoming slides okay now why do we want to study all this uh, as i mentioned in the beginning the first motivation is that we would like to mimic the motion of biological micro swimmers so that we can understand how these biological micro swimmers are able to move in a variety of uh, uh, surroundings uh, how are how how they are able to perform self assemblies their colonies and so on okay besides that there is from application point of view they are very interesting systems because we can probably use them in drug deliveries or cargo deliveries in microscopic domains we can also probably use them as bio uh, imaging agents and in biodiagnostics and so on so with that motivation our group is also actively interested in synthesizing these chemical micro swimmers and then understanding their motion in variety of circumstances so as i mentioned the focus of today's talk is active droplets or self propelled droplets now as i mentioned that these are typically droplets of one fluid dispersed is dispersed in another immiscible fluid and when we have to do that we need to add surfactant okay so we add a lot of surfactant in the system such that the surfactant concentration is significantly beyond the critical micellar concentration then what happens is that you have this uh, droplet which is decorated with surfactant molecules and in the surrounding media you have plenty of free micelles okay because the surfactant concentration is significantly beyond the critical micellar concentration now because of that whenever this droplet encounters any free micelle the micelle dumps a lot of surfactant on the droplet interface at that instant and then it dissolves by pinching away part of the droplet and in that process it also borrows some surfactant from the droplet interface some additional surfactants it borrows so it leaves as a filled micelle so as you can see in this schematic we have this droplet which collides with one of these free empty micelles and then these filled micelles are released by the droplet 
So in this process, what happens is that a missile comes to the droplet, it solubilizes part of the droplet, and hence the mechanism is known as micellar solubilization. And in this micellar solubilization, since excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, I did not get the point. What is basically the mechanism happening here? Can you please repeat? Yeah. So see, we have this droplet which is decorated by surfactant. Okay. Yes. And in the surrounding media, you have plenty of free missiles because the surfactant concentration is beyond CMC. Yes, sir. So whenever there is a random collision between this droplet and a surfactant molecule and a free missile, yes. the missile pinches away part of the droplet. And in, yeah. in this pinching process, which is essentially a solubilization process, part of the droplet is released in the filled missile. Now you can see this was an empty missile and this is a filled missile. Yes. So some part of the droplet goes away with the filled missile. So it's a solubilization process. Yeah. And since missile is inducing this process, we call it missile solubilization. Now, okay. when the free missile goes from an empty state to a filled state, its size increases because now we have some droplet, some material in it. Because of that enhanced size, it has to borrow some extra surfactant from the droplet interface. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes. So, because of this solubilization process, a spontaneous asymmetry in the surfactant coverage across the droplet is generated because this filled missile has taken away some additional surfactant from the droplet interface. So spontaneously it generates an asymmetry and this surfactant concentration gradients generates Marangoni stress at the droplet interface. And because of those Marangoni stresses, we get an interfacial flow from low interfacial tension region towards the high interfacial tension region. right? And since the overall system is supposed to be force free, we have not applied any external force. So to balance the linear momentum, the droplet gets propelled in the opposite direction. All right. And once the droplet starts moving, it gets a fresh supply of free missiles from its front. So all of these free missiles are being supplied to the droplet from the front. These free missiles again facilitate the droplet solubilization and the droplet is observed to leave a trail of these filled missiles from behind. So you can argue, one can say that the missiles, the free missiles are acting as the fuel for the droplet. All right. So this is the way we generate a spontaneous asymmetry here and which leads to self propulsion in a system where we do not have any inbuilt asymmetry to start with. Now this is different from the active genus colloids system where the particles themselves have an asymmetry to start with. So that there, the invoking asymmetry is very simple. But in this case, the invoking asymmetry is slightly complicated, but by adding a lot of surfactant and through this micellar solubilization, we are able to do that, okay? So the particular system that we have worked with in our lab is where we have chosen the droplet phase to be a 5 CB liquid crystal droplet, which is an oil actually. And in the continuous phase, we have water. And to that, we have added T-tab as surfactant. And to that, we have added different kinds of solutes depending on what kind of environment we want to create. Okay. And through this process, we get a very beautiful um, self-propulsion of these oil droplets, as you can see in this movie. And we have also used a fluorescence microscopy to confirm that these droplets, when they are propelling, they leave a trail of filled missiles in their rear end, all right? Now, about, so these are not very new systems and we are not the first ones to uh, work on these systems. There has been some work. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. In the previous slide, how is the, how are the filled missiles being visualized? So what we have done here is that we have added Nile red as a dye, fluorescence dye to the oil phase. So once the oil phase is getting solubilized, in form of the filled missiles, we are able to visualize them through fluorescence microscopy. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying that we are not the first ones to uh, study the system. There has been some work already and I will brief you what are the major findings of these self-propelled droplets motion in Newtonian fluids because that is what, that is where majority of the work has been done. So if you take any simple Newtonian environment, a stationary environment, it has been uh, observed 
that these droplets start moving in a particular direction in a ballistic manner. But as we wait longer, the trajectory transitions from a ballistic trajectory to a random trajectory. Okay. So if you look at the mean square displacement, it is uh, it scales as two at short times, but at longer times, it starts to scale as one. And that is because when the droplet has changed the direction sufficiently, we observe this randomness coming in at longer times. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, sir, what is the experimental system here? Uh, in all like these cases, the experimental system uh, is again same 5 CB liquid crystal as the oil droplet, water okay. as the continuous phase with P tab as surfactant. Oh, oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, as I was mentioning, um, T tab acts as fuel. So, the more fuel we add, we, we get higher propulsion speed of these active droplets. Okay. Um, in 2018, uh, this particular group by Corinna Maas, they came up with a very beautiful work where this uh, uh, reported that these droplets are actually very sensitive to their surrounding and they sense the presence of surfactant very, very properly. And in doing so, they are able to migrate themselves preferentially towards the region where you have higher and higher concentration of surfactant. Okay. This behavior is known as chemotaxis and it is very similar to what bacteria do when they are trying to uh, swim through an environment in search of some nutrient. All right? And they also showed that not only did these droplets do chemotaxis, but they also do negative chemotaxis, wherein they try to stay away from regions which are rich in filled missiles. Okay, So they want to get fresh surfactant supply, but they want to stay away from regions which are already filled with which, which are rich in filled missiles. So if one can argue that filled missiles act as poison, whereas surfactant as a nutrient for these droplets. Okay. Um, last year, uh, from our group, we demonstrated that when we add these droplets in an environment where you have a shear flow, so in this case, the flow is from right to left, and we demonstrated that by manipulating the flow properly, we can actually observe these droplets to migrate upstream. So they can go against the flow and perform uh, what we call as Rio taxes. Okay, so one can use this uh, property of these active droplets in order to uh, uh, specifically deliver cargo at targeted locations, specifically specifically in conditions where you have external flow. Okay, uh, in all the in all of these studies that I have talked about, the capillary number associated with their motion is actually very less than one. And hence, no shape deformation has been observed so far. So we can argue that the viscous forces are not strong enough to deform the droplet shape. Okay. Now, this is all good. This is all in Newtonian environment. But where we wanted to take this work forward is wherein we would like to investigate the motion of these droplets in slightly complicated environments where the surrounding is not simply water-like media, but it is a more sort of a media where we have different solutes added to the system and those solutes can be either molecular solutes or macromolecular solutes because for all sort of practical applications that we are interested in that i talked about at the very beginning we need to understand the motion of these micro swimmers in biological fluids for example which are non newtonian behavior okay so with that motivation what we did was we first used glycerol as a molecular solute and glycerol is a very commonly known viscosity modifier also. And our, ob our objective was that, okay, once we add glycerol to water, what happens to the motion of these droplets? Because now we are able to tune the viscosity of the surrounding media. Okay. So we did some careful experiments where we started with a simple water-like system. And then we gradually added glycerol to it. So we added 20 weight percent, 50, 60, and 80 weight percent of glycerol which led to an increase in viscosity from one centipoise all the way to 45 centipoise. So it's a significant increase in viscosity. But what we observed was very, very uh, unintuitive uh, result. That is, in water, the droplet was moving smoothly, which was already known, which was expected. But in case of um, when we had significant amount of glycerol to the media, the droplet motion became extremely jittery. Okay, so as you can see in this movie, as well as in the trajectories, the motion is not smooth, rather it is extremely jittery. And the droplet is undergoing a series of stop and go, stop and go kind of events. 
Okay, so that was very counterintuitive because we are increasing viscosity of the media, but the motion is becoming jittery, and it is counterintuitive because from Stokes Einstein prediction, we would argue that if the viscosity of the media is increasing, then the rotational diffusivity should be suppressed, so the motion should become more smoother, more smooth actually. Right. So this jitteriness, onset of jitteriness because of increasing viscosity was something not. Um, understandable and we also looked into the speed of these droplets and we observed that by increasing viscosity the speed of the droplet also increases uh, that was the, at least the first observation because increasing glycerol increases viscosity and that increases the speed of the droplet okay and uh, as expected if we calculate the persistent length associated with the trajectories the things increasing viscosity the persistent length decreases which is an indicative of the motion being more jittery so the conclusion is that despite increase in viscosity the jitteriness in the motion increases and the droplet speed also increases right now as i mentioned as i explained in the mechanism itself that the solubilization of the droplet is the reason behind its propulsion right so if the droplet speed is increasing we need to look into how are the droplets being solubilized so what is the rate of solubilization okay so with that we looked into the rate of solubilization of these droplets under different conditions and what we found was that by increasing glycerol concentration the rate of solubilization actually increases okay and in fact going from water to 88% glycerol system the rate of solubilization was tripled uh, in in quantity okay so that explains the increase in speed of the droplet because the rate of solubilization is increasing so the droplet is expected to uh, move with higher speed but that still does not explain why does the droplet perform jittery motion in in the presence of glycerol so we decided okay we need to do some additional experiments where we use some different solute other than glycerol to understand this behavior whether it is the rate of solubilization or the viscosity effect so what we did was we decided to add peo which is a molecule which is a, a polymer polyethylene oxide and we decided to add different molecular weights of this peo to the uh, continuous phase so this is the uh, control experiment water glycerol in water the system the droplets are moving smoothly in glycerol the droplets are moving jittery performing jittery motion now when we added polymer so we started with 25.8% of low molecular weight polymer so this is 35000 and then we 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 used 15.8% of 100000 okay and the concentration of these polymers was chosen in such a way that we maintain nearly similar bulk viscosity okay so if you look at the viscosity as in case of glycerol so glycerol here has the viscosity of around 32 centipoise here we get viscosity around 30 45 centipoise so there is not a huge difference in viscosity the rate of solubilization if you look the rate of solubilization is similar to the rate of solubilization in water okay so the rate of sir, solubilization is yeah sir uh, how you are ensuring that uh, the bulk viscosity will be same in all these cases but approximately same um, by manipulating the concentration of this polymer yeah no actually i am just asking that how basically you are getting the uh, viscosity value oh that we do uh, through a simple rheological experiment okay okay so you run a simple oscillatory shear rheology experiments in a flow sweep and then you get the data oh okay sir. okay or you can use a viscometer also actually oh, okay. okay okay yeah so the key feature here is that despite the fact that the rate of solubilization is now similar to the rate of solubilization in water and viscosity being similar to glycerol we observe this jitteriness in the motion now that gives us some preliminary idea okay maybe it is the rate of solubilization because in all three cases where we have jitteriness in the motion the rate of solubilization is the common factor sorry sorry not the rate of solubilization the viscosity is the common factor the rate of solubilization is similar to water in all three systems we have similar viscosity so maybe the viscosity is the reason behind this jitteriness and that was the preliminary observation then what we did was we used even higher molecular weights of polymer so we tried 600000 um, 1 million um, molecular weights okay of different concentrations yeah 
uh, actually this is i'm sorry this is supposed to be 8000 this one so this is 600k this is 1000k and this is 8000k again such that we maintain nearly the similar viscosity in all the cases and also the rate of solubilization is not very different from the rate of solubilization in water but now what we see is that the the motion of the droplet becomes very smooth okay so that overall gives us an idea that somehow from these experiments we are not able to conclude uh, actually we are able to conclude that the jitteriness in the motion does not purely depends on viscosity and it does not purely depends on rate of solubilization also because by varying by choosing different molecular solutes and macromolecular solutes we have independently manipulated viscosity independently manipulated rate of solubilization and jitteriness does not appear to be consistent with any of these parameters okay so then when we are trying to find out answer to these questions we came across this work by michelin and co-workers in 2019 and it is a uh, analytical work where they propose that the droplet motion is actually very dependent on the peclet number associated with their motion okay so they solved a convection diffusion equation associated with the missiles uh, that are available and they propose this peclet number to be the extremely critical non dimensionalized number for their motion and they argued that when we increase the peclet number and in this case they propose that when the peclet number goes from 4 around 4 to 75 then the droplet observes this unusual mode of motion where the motion of the droplet is actually arrested momentarily and then the droplet has to restart its motion again okay so if that happens that can explain the jitteriness in the motion because in the, in the end the jitteriness in the motion is what the droplet is moving it's stopping and then restarting its motion again stopping and then the process repeats okay so based on this prediction we decided okay let us also look at the peclet number in our system so the way we calculated peclet number was we know the size of the droplet we know the speed of the droplet and d which is the diffusivity of missiles for that we use a stokes einstein relation uh, which is nothing but kbt by 6 pi eta r r is the approximate size of the missile which is roughly around 5 nanometer and eta here is the bulk viscosity of the continuous phase okay and we have all of the data so we calculated peclet number in the different systems that we have and then we plotted the persistent length of the different trajectories with respect to the peclet number that we just calculated but unfortunately we observe that again there is no trend all so for the same peclet number we observe there are different kinds of a persistent length that we observe okay so from here we concluded that the peclet number that we are calculating based on um, the stokes einstein diffusivity of the missile and the speed of the droplet is not able to capture this transition properly okay so then what we did was we decided to calculate the diffusivity of the missiles experimentally so instead of relying on the stokes einstein relation to calculate this uh, diffusivity we decided to measure it experimentally and that we did by our flow size experiment which i mentioned in the beginning that we load the droplet with a, a dye and once the droplet is being solubilized it leaves a trail of these uh, filled missiles at its rear end and so if we measure the intensity at any location and plot it with respect to the um, the axis then by looking at the intensity variation we can actually calculate the diffusivity of the missiles okay so that we did and now if we try to look at the experimentally measured diffusivity with respect to the diffusivity which stokes einstein relation gives us and then when we plot it with respect to the different fluid what we observe is that for high molecular weight systems which were 100k 600k 1000k and 8000k for all those high molecular weight systems the experimental measured diffusivity is actually much much larger than the theoretical prediction which is the stokes einstein prediction now this is very very unusual because one would not expect the missile diffusivity to be much much larger than the stokes einstein prediction correct and that is not the first observation of such kind 
in fact when we look at nanoparticle diffusion in polymer solutions it has already been reported that whenever we have we are dealing with systems where size of the nanoparticle is actually smaller than the length scale available in the surrounding media then the nanoparticles do not experience the bulk viscosity okay because their size is so small that the continuum approximation breaks down so when the nanoparticles are diffusing they do not see the polymer media as a continuum all right so what they experience is is a much much lesser viscosity and hence because of that lesser viscosity they are able to diffuse much faster i hope this point is clear to all of you so that prediction already exists for nanoparticles and there are several experimental studies which have seen that in fact in my phd also i have looked i have investigated that so that gave us an idea maybe we should also look into the relative size of micelle and the polymer in the polymer solution system and we did that in fact and we found that if you look at the ratio of polymer length scale which is rs with respect to the micelle size which is a in high molecular weight systems this ratio is very very large in fact we reach up to a size of a ratio of 100 so that tells us for high molecular weight polymer systems the polymer length scale is approximately 100 times larger than the micelle size okay so in this schematic i'm trying to uh, emphasize that the micelles which is a spherical uh, which is represented as sphere here is actually much smaller than the surrounding polymer size so when this micelle will diffuse it will try to move it will not experience the bulk viscosity that you typically measure from your rheological experiments or through viscometer okay rather this micelle will experience some local viscosity that will depend on mostly the the solvent that is water in our case because the continuous phase is water okay so that explains the fact that why are we observing a much higher diffusivity for micelles in case of high molecular weight solution systems right and with this idea now we calculated a modified peclet number now where the d that we are using to calculate modified peclet number is not the d predicted by stokes einstein relation rather it is a experimentally determined diffusion coefficient for micelles okay and when when we do that and we try to understand the variation in the persistent length with respect to this modified peclet number peclet star we see a systematic decrease in persistent length with increasing peclet number okay and this increase in peclet number is what was predicted by michelin and coworkers which i mentioned in the beginning let me go back to that here and that is what the prediction was that if you increase the peclet number somewhere at higher peclet number you will get a state where the droplet motion is momentarily arrested and that can lead to the jitteriness in the motion so that is what we also finally predicted using this modified peclet number that when we increase the peclet star the persistent length decreases and hence we argue that in order to successfully capture this transition from a smooth to a jittery motion one can do that by carefully computing this peclet number where the d is not the uh, diffusivity of the micelle based on the bulk viscosity but rather d is the experimental measure diffusion coefficient accounting for the local viscosity that these micelles experience because the, their size is so small as compared to the surrounding polymer media i hope this point is uh, i'm able to convey this point properly to all of you are there any questions so far before i move forward yeah sir i have yeah actually you have shown that because as the uh, at the length scale of the polymer uh, polymers is of the uh, is 100 times higher than the micelles yeah so it experiences the local viscosity so the micelle but, experience but, yes yes and uh, the jittery motion is due to that No, no 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 why so jittery motion is not due to that in fact i should have shown a slide here um jittery motion is always for the case of uh, glycerol and lower molecular weights of polymer yes sir yes okay that is yeah. where the peclet is actually high 
yeah okay actually i just connected these two things right Sorry. so if yes. if you look at this formula rv by d right yeah yeah so when we have the high molecular weight systems there the diffusion coefficient will also be high so that yes. will lead to a lower peclet yes okay yes so lower peclet means a smooth motion yeah yeah okay. yes high peclet means jittery motion so if i go back to this slide here yeah so if you look at this particular data all of the high molecular weight system 600k 1000k and this was supposed to be 8000k yes. for all these systems the motion is smooth yes but if we calculate the pecle number the modified pecle number it will be low for these systems because of higher diffusivity yeah yeah yes okay but I all know. these systems where we have jitteriness in their motion if we calculate the pecle there the pecle will be larger because the diffusivity of missiles is smaller yes and the diffusivity is smaller because missiles are of roughly same size as the surrounding media so when the missiles move or they try to diffuse they experience the bulk viscosity which is higher so they move yes. slower they diffuse yes. slowly so diffusivity is less so pecle is higher yes yes all right yes okay then next we wanted to do was that okay we understand what is the effect of um uh, changing the local viscosity right now what we wanted to do was okay let us try to keep the local viscosity same and then vary the bulk viscosity and then see what happens so what we did was we used one particular molecular weight which was 8000k 8000 kda <coughs> so around 8 million but we increased the concentration of that polymer gradually okay so when we did that we found that the associated pecle the pecle star actually decreased systematically so when we go from zero concentration of polymer to around 1 weight percent of polymer there was a systematic decrease in the associated pecle number okay and that systematic decrease in pecle number was also coupled with this behavior wherein we see that in case of water although the trajectories are smooth but there is a randomness that comes in the trajectories at longer times somehow by increasing the polymer concentration and by lowering this pecle star we observed that the motion is smooth which is we already established but more importantly the trajectories are very very persistent in nature okay the duration of the trajectories in both the cases is same here the trajectories are random but here the trajectories are very very streamlined very persistent okay and this is and please note that the local viscosity in both the cases is same so this is 1% uh, 8000 8 8 million po and this is just water okay and since this is 1 weight percent po of 8 million the local viscosity that the missile experiences is actually the same but the bulk viscosity is very different and there is a difference of around 10 to power 4 in their bulk viscosity in water sir, it experiences yes sir, sir. why it is sir uh, the local viscosity is same but how the bulk viscosity is changing see bulk viscosity is what you typically measure through rheology experiment so yes. there you try to flow the entire liquid yeah so if you try to push the liquid in any bulk environment the viscosity that matters to you is the bulk viscosity yes that is what you will measure yeah okay but yes. if you think in terms of the missile the missile size is just 5 nanometer right yeah. Yeah. and i did not mention but if you calculate the polymer characteristic length scale in this particular case that would be of the order of i think 70 to 80 nanometer oh. okay so the missile is actually very small yes. so when the missile is trying to diffuse it will not care whether there are polymers in the surrounding or not because the size of the polymer is so large yes okay yes. so yes. as a consequence the local viscosity which the missile experiences is much lesser than that and in fact that viscosity is same as water yeah. because that is what all the missile will observe water only yes okay yes so that is the main point the local viscosity is same but the bulk viscosity is very different and the result is that pecle star decreases but more importantly the trajectories become very very persistent in nature 
and this is a very very remarkable result because uh, randomness in the motion is a big big challenge right and here we have demonstrated that by adding small amount of high molecular weight polymer we can actually make the trajectories very very persistent okay all right then the next thing we wanted to understand was this is all good so now we know how to manipulate the peclet number we know how to uh, make the trajectories more persistent but we would like to answer okay why are the trajectories becoming more persistent correct so to answer that we decided to look into the swimming strategy of these droplets so what do i mean by swimming strategy see we know that all of these micro swimmers they are able to swim themselves uh, they are able to swim and inspired from that we have these beautiful swimming droplets which are also able to move autonomously but when they are swimming they can adopt different kinds of modes for example e coli is a very well known pusher which means that it generates propulsion from its uh, rear end so it shakes up the liquid at its rear end and then it pushes itself okay on the other hand a different microorganisms such as chlamydomonas is known to be a puller so it pulls in liquid from the front and try to propel itself so it's a puller okay in fact um, in 1971 blake and coworkers they proposed a very simple squirmer model wherein they gave analytical solution to uh, a spherical object moving in a in an environment in an axisymmetric flow they proposed that the fluid flow can be approximated as this uh, expression which is nothing but a legendre polynomial solution okay and then they said that if you uh, truncate this legendre polynomial solution for second degree only one can get some idea about this slip at the similar surface in terms of these expressions and by calculating beta which is nothing but b2 over b1 we can actually get an idea about the swimming strategy analytically okay so if we calculate beta so in the nutshell we don't have to worry about the details in the, in the nutshell if we are able to calculate beta if beta is less than 0 that tells us that it's a pusher if beta is greater than 0 it tells us that it's a puller and in fact if beta is equal to 0 then it tells us that it's a neutral kind of a swimmer okay which is what paramecium does so paramecium is a neutral kind of a swimmer so overall idea here is that what we decided to do was we decided to do some experiments and try to understand the swimming mode or the propulsion mode of these droplets under different conditions so for that we did some piv experiments wherein we seed the continuous media with some fluorophores we track them we do a simple piv experiment and get these flow field around the droplet and once we have that flow field on the droplet we can also calculate the beta and that gives us an idea about the droplet is a pusher or a puller okay so in case of water how big, yeah how big is the particle so these are very tiny the particles uh, these are very tiny particles these are of the order of uh, i guess 700 nanometer or so Okay. and how do you do the uh, piv measurements what kind of fluorophores do you use uh i do not remember the exact name for the fluorophore but i guess these are uh, some green fluorophores and what we do is we just take a series of images and then we try to find a correlation between different images and through that we get these trajectories okay okay yeah so once we do the experiments we found that in case of water the beta values are actually less than 0 so there is droplets they are acting as pushers but when we put them in high molecular weight polymers where the motion was very very straight lined there the droplets are actually puller okay so by changing the polymer concentration what we have done is that we have changed the nature of these droplets swimming strategy and the beta value actually increases okay so going from water like system to a high molecular weight polymeric system the beta value becomes more and more positive which is resulting in the droplet becoming puller line puller kind of a swimmer rather than being a pusher kind of a swimmer okay and this is why since the droplets are puller in nature 
right? And I mentioned when the droplet is polar, what does it do? It pulls in the fluid from its front end. Okay, that is what a puller is because it pulls in the fluid from its front end. Now, when the droplet is pulling fluid from the front end, it is more likely to follow that path because I mentioned in the very beginning, these droplets perform chemotaxis. Now, what is chemotaxis? These droplets would like to go towards the region where you find more and more surfactant. So, if the droplet is a puller, it is pulling fluid from its front. So, you can see this is pulling fluid from its front, right? So, droplet is more biased to move in that direction itself because that is the region from where it is getting the fresh surfactant. Okay. So, that is the reason why we observe a more persistent motion in case of high molecular weight systems because the droplet is a puller there. Versus in case of water, where droplet is a weak pusher, so it is pulling fluid from the sides, not from the front. And since it is pulling fluid from the side, it is more susceptible to change its direction and eventually the trajectory becomes random. All right. Uh, I, I hope, is this point clear? And no, sir. See, the, is this clear ki that in high molecular polymers, the droplet is a puller? Yes. So as you can, can probably see in this image, when the droplet is puller, it is pulling fluid from the front. Is it clear? Yes, yes. So the supply of fresh surfactant is more from the front all the time. Yeah. The streamlines are such that they are bringing in surfactants from the front only. So the yes. droplet has this tendency to go towards the region where you have more and more fresh surfactant. That is known as chemotaxis. Yes. So now this is the region from where it is getting more supply of fresh surfactant. So droplet is always biased to move in that direction. Yeah. Okay. So which is why yes. it moves more straight line. Whereas in this case, you see that the supply of fresh surfactant is from the sides actually. Yes. Okay. So when this droplet is try to move, it can actually change its direction because the supply is not from the front, it is from the sides. Yes. Which is why the trajectory eventually becomes random because yeah. the droplet is more susceptible to change its direction because of its pusher mode. Okay. Yes. But that does not happen with systems where we have high molecular weight of polymer because the droplet is a puller. All right. So uh, with this, uh, that is the conclusion to the first part of the talk. So we demonstrated that by carefully manipulating the type of solute that we add to the continuous media. For the first time, we have demonstrated that by using polymers at, as additives, we can in fact reduce the Peclet number associated with the droplet motion. And so far, it has not been reported ever. And by reducing the Peclet number, we have for the first time again demonstrated that the droplets can be polar also because so far it was believed that the droplets are always pushers, but we demonstrated the droplets can become polar also and that can lead to a more smooth and persistent motion as compared to what was reported earlier, wherein we know in case of water, the droplet is random in nature and by increasing Peclet number at max, we can achieve a jitteriness in the motion. But our objective was to get more streamlined motion and that is what we have achieved by adding polymers as solute to the system. Okay, so that was the first part of the talk. Uh, Ashtosh, how much time do I have? Here you have seven minutes. Okay, you can so maybe, take more time if you need. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll not go into the details uh, significantly for the next half, but I'll definitely uh, introduce you with the some of the observations because they are very very um, nice so you can take next, 15 minutes sir yeah perfect so then what we did next was so so far we limited ourselves to systems where we added polymer but the systems were not viscoelastic properly because the concentration of polymer was such that um, we were not in the viscoelastic regime okay but then we wanted to understand the motion of this droplet in a viscoelastic environment. Okay. And for that, what we did was we use the same 8,000 K polymer, 8 million molecular weight of PEO. We used one weight percent of uh, polymer concentration. 
but we increase the surfactant concentration from 6% to 21 weight percent it's a very very significant increase in the surfactant concentration so the fuel concentration has been increased all right now what is the purpose to increase the fuel concentration the purpose is to increase the debra number because debra number decides whether we will be able to observe viscoelasticity in the system or not now what is debra number debra number is the ratio of the two characteristic time scales one time scale is tau which represents the relaxation of the polymer present in the surrounding and the other time scale is r by v right that is the time scale associated with the droplet movement so if debra number is high which means that the polymer has a higher relaxation time compared to the droplet movement so then we are bound to observe some viscoelasticity in the system if debra number is low which means the polymer relaxation is lesser than the droplet movement so by the time the droplet moves the polymer is expected to relax we would not observe any viscoelasticity in the medium okay so which is why in this system by increasing surfactant concentration from 6 weight percent to 21 weight percent we intentionally increase the value of v that is the droplet speed and as a result we increase the debra number associated with the droplet movement okay so now we have increased the debra number so we expect viscoelasticity to play some important role and what is that we observe that when the droplet moves um, not able to play this video let me ha huh. so when the droplet moves i hope you can all see that the droplet shape is actually deformed now okay let me play it again the droplet is not maintaining the spherical shape anymore rather it is deformed from its rear end all right now this is despite the fact that the capillary number associated with the droplet motion is still very small quantity but the droplet is getting deformed right so that tells us that the viscous stresses alone are not responsible the viscosity is alone not responsible for this deformation of the droplet because the capillary number is actually low okay then what is the reason for it the answer to that we uh, and before we move forward if we increase the debra number gradually so from um, in the last slide we observed the debra number to be 0.2 if we increase it to 0.35 0.44 and 0.5 we notice that the deformation and we calculated deformation by some definition the deformation in the droplet shape actually increased so the more debra number the higher the debra number the more deformation we observed okay now similar kind of a deformation has been reported earlier in case of rising bubbles in viscoelastic fluid so there was this beautiful work by leel and coworkers in 1993 where they observed rising air bubbles in a polymeric solution and those bubbles were also deformed in a very similar manner so what they did was they proposed a fene model to predict the shape of the droplet so what we did and in fact one one of my collaborators dr navin tiwari what he did was he used the same model and he tweaked it a little bit to make it suitable to our system and then predicted the droplet shape and in this image here what i am showing you in the black line is the droplet shape predicted by that fene model and the red symbols are the experimentally measured droplet shape so we observe a very very good match between the experiments and the model prediction so it confirms that the deformation of the droplet is because of the extra normal stresses generated by polymer stretching so let me explain this so this is the front region of the droplet when the droplet has not reached there the polymers are in their natural equilibrium conformation so the polymer network is unstretched okay but when the droplet is moving because of the flow field on the droplet at the rear end the polymer chains are highly stretched okay because this droplet when it moves it generates an extensile flow at its rear end the fluid will come like this uh, the fluid will come like this and it will go like this so at it at, at its rear end the flow profile is actually extensile in nature now because of that the polymer network is extremely deformed 
Now that deformation leads to the generation of extra normal stresses and those normal stresses are able to deform the droplet from its rear end. Okay. And these normal stresses uh, are known to produce these uh, unusual effects. For example, one of the unusual effects is, I hope, uh, I'm not sure if you all have seen that, is this die swelling effect or this rod climb eff effect of polymer solutions. Right. In all those cases, the normal stresses in the polymer solutions are responsible for that unusual behavior. And because of, of the fact that this model is able to predict the experimental shape so nicely, we strongly believe that in our case also, these normal stresses are what are leading to the deformation of the droplet shape. Okay. Then we wanted to even be even more adventurous. So we increase the polymer concentration even further in an attempt to increase the Deborah number also uh, even further. Okay. Now what we observe is something very, very unusual that droplet undergoes this complex shape deformation that is time dependent shape deformation and it performs this zigzag kind of a motion. So let me try to play it again. Yeah. So now the deformation of the droplet shape is not steady. It is time dependent as well as the droplet speed is also appears to be time dependent and it performs this unusual zigzag motion. Okay. So if you look at the trajectory and we pick one persistent path, which is this path. And if you look at droplet deformation at the different regions, what we find is that when the droplet starts one persistent cycle, it has very less deformation. Going forward, the deformation increases, but the deformation at that time is at its front end. It is deformed from the front. As we move, as the droplet moves forward, the deformation migrates from the front part towards the center part. So droplet becomes elongated. Towards the end, the droplet deformation decreases and the deformation now migrates towards the rear end. So here the droplet is deformed from its rear end. And eventually when the droplet comes to an end of that cycle, deformation again becomes very, very less. And the droplet shape also uh, comes to nearly a spherical. Okay. So in this one particular cycle, our observation is that the droplet speed increases, then decreases, increases, then decreases. Correspondingly, the deformation also increases and decreases. And when the deformation is increasing, it's getting deformed from the front and then from the center. And towards the end, when the deformation is decreasing, the deformation shifts towards the rear end. So it's sort of a wave that propagates across the droplet. Initially, the droplet deforms on the front, then center, and then towards the rear. Okay. And associated Debra number, if you calculate, that also increases and then decreases. All right. So once again, we perform some PIV experiments and we try to understand the mode of the droplet in this complicated trajectory. So we, we found that when the droplet is speeding up and when the droplet is deformed from the front, it is actually puller. When the droplet is at its highest speed and it's deforming from the center part, it is elongated completely. At that time, it is a neutral swimmer. And when the droplet is slowing down, when the deformation is towards the rear end, it is actually a pusher. Okay. So without going into the details, why this puller kind of a mode leads to this kind of a deformation, um, what we can, what I'll just leave you here with is that this is a very complex phenomena. The deformation is coupled with the droplet shape and the droplet shape is coupled with it. Uh, uh, with the swimming mode that the droplet adopts. Okay. We do have some understanding of why the droplet performs this zigzag kind of a motion, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip those details. Uh, with, with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this seminar series. Uh, this is my group that we have at IIT Kanpur. Um, funding agencies contribution is extremely important. So a big thanks to them. The work that I've done is in collaboration with uh, some excellent colleagues in our department, Dr. Dipin Pillai and Dr. Naveen Tiwari. 
and the whole work that i talked about today has been done by my outstanding student pratik duvedi who is now ready to graduate and is looking for postdoc positions with that uh, thank you and i'll be happy to take questions if we have time hello sir yeah um, can you please go few slides back sure when uh, there the droplet motion is you are showing yeah like here. just before that yeah yeah so uh, here in the uh, different side of the droplet there are some black patches and there are some gray ones so the, the this is this due to the micelles so these so when this droplet is getting solubilized it is known that some oil can all some water can also seep into the droplet okay yeah and since these are liquid crystal droplets which is a nematic phase these oil these water can arrange in tiny droplets right and they can form strings kinds of structures so what we see these patches is actually those water molecules or water droplets that are accumulated inside the oil droplet okay okay these are tiny yeah. tiny water droplets that we see yeah okay. but those have nothing to do with the droplet shape deformation because i mean you can control that to some extent by by changing the temperature also but not but we still observe the droplet deformation all the time okay and sir a uh, few more technical questions yeah uh, like uh, for the shape of the droplet uh, or the size of the droplet how you are controlling the size every time you are doing experiment suppose you are taking 50 micron size droplet yeah. so how you are controlling that one? so we have a micro injector uh, which is a device which allows you to inject controlled volume using pressure difference okay so through that we always inject the known amount of volume into the system that leads to uh, the controlled size of the droplets okay okay yeah so uh, it is really and we really enjoyed that talk really yeah. nice. i'm happy to hear yeah. that yeah Sir, I have a question. Uh, what is the range of the droplet size that we uh, manage? Um, in fact, I mean, by adjusting the pressure, uh, and that depends on the device itself. What we have done is we have obtained droplet size ranging from ten micrometers to up to two hundred micrometers. But I know there are more sophisticated micro injectors which allow you to um, increase the range even further. okay sir with the increase in concentration does the uh, diameter of the droplet vary so increase in concentration of what uh, surfactant no no so surfactant concentration just changes the speed of the droplet okay okay um, the, the size is controlled just big by the how much volume of oil you are injecting uh, but Does the size exactly fifty micrometer all of the droplets, or uh, there is a variation in size in between, uh, or twenty to eighty, or something? Uh, there is a range. No, no, this is a very controlled experiment. So you are able to inject volume very precisely. So each and every droplet is of the same size. Okay, sir. Thank you. yeah sir sir few more questions yeah definitely uh, yeah and uh, sir uh, in case of uh, if you increase or decrease the size uh, than the 50 micron one so is there any uh, change in behavior of the droplet like uh, uh, no, uh, a, from the dynamics that's point that's an excellent question actually so uh, by changing the size of the droplet uh, i could not mention here um, we can actually change the speed of the droplet because there has been a lot of literature where it has been shown that if you increase the size of the droplet the speed increases yeah okay so if you are changing the droplet size you are actually changing this de bora number yes right? so here we have changed the droplet speed by changing the surfactant concentration yes you can also change the droplet speed by changing the size so yeah. that will also change the de bora number but in the end uh, depends on this de bora number whether you will be able to observe deformation or not yeah uh, what i believe is that a larger size of the droplet can deform sooner because that will be at a higher de bora yeah because yeah. that will be coming up with a higher speed also actually yes yes yeah and sir uh, you have done the experiments with uh, 5cb pneumatic liquid crystals yes so what if you take different kind of liquid crystals yeah uh, once so we have uh, tested this that 
we with increase in temperature if we take the droplet from nematic phase to the isotropic phase yes we still observe deformations but we have not quantified the extent of deformation but that at least gives us an idea that the nematic phase plays not an important role actually okay. because even in the isotropic phase we see observe deformation but okay. by increasing temperature we are actually changing the viscosity of the media so that can result in some difference in the deformations so coming to your question if we change the the liquid crystal i still believe that we should still observe such deformations and everything but the extent of deformation may vary from the viscosity that is there available in the system yeah yeah uh, and sir one more question uh -huh. uh, which is uh, as 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 surfactant you have used t tab right uh, and it is uh, for your experiment you have done the perform the experiment above critical micellar concentration right yeah there are uh, different kind of t uh, c tab or different other sort of surfactant also can uh, go uh, undergo this kind of critical micellar concentration so right. will there be any change in dynamics um again, so see we have not tried uh changing the surfactant because uh, i remember long back we tried c tab but uh, we did not observe any motion actually okay and uh, this particular combination of liquid crystal and t tab is a very very known combination it works all the time so we have always stuck to this but yeah coming to your question if we are able to find another suitable surfactant yes. um we can still observe this the things that will vary is that the surface tension will change but if the surface tension does not change significantly we should still observe this deformation and again what kind of viscosity do we have in the system because it will change the cmc right so now yes. if the cmc changes and depending on the concentration that you are maintaining your speed will also change yes what i'm trying to say in the nutshell is that by changing surfactant you can actually change viscosity and the speed of the droplet yeah yeah yes that can again give you a different variety difference in the debra number and then different deformation yeah and sir as uh, the as the droplet is leaving the field micelles so in fact the field micelle think... is leaving the droplet not the droplet yeah, uh, yeah. okay i because uh, the the micelles are taking away some part of the droplet no yes yes so my cells are leaving the droplet by taking part of it yes yes so uh, with increasing size the dro droplet size basically increasing time with increasing time the droplet size is being decreased yes 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 in fact that is what i i showed in the one of the slides uh, let me go back to that so this is exactly that experiment where we measured the size of the droplet with time oh, okay. so you see there is a decrease and that is how we measure the rate of solubilization yes sir. I, i i understand thank you sir. Right. thank you very but much. all of those observations that, that i have reported in terms of the droplet being more persistent or yes. the deformations all of those experiments are performed at much smaller time scale somewhere in, in a matter of few hundreds of seconds right so yeah. in that time scale the droplet size is roughly the same because here you see that we observe a significant variation in droplet size for an hour or so but the experiments yeah. are just few minutes we don't see a change in size that much yeah yeah, yeah. here another another question i have uh, yeah. so for uh, such a long duration experiment like 60 minute or 60 70 minute so is not the droplet getting out uh, out of your field of view yeah so we have to actually one has to sit down and move your a uh, field of move your stage actually in order to maintain focus all the time so that yes. is that is a time consuming experiment actually and <laughs> pratik was patient enough to do it yes yeah, yeah yeah thank you sir yeah sir thank you uh once again thank you rahul sir for uh, this talk i'm sure yeah, we all learned something yeah. we all learned something from this uh so okay great yeah thank you all right thank you okay thank you for taking out taking time out of this for yeah. taking yeah. time out of your schedule and yeah yeah
yeah i bye think bye. that's okay yeah. thank you bye bye thank you bye, bye.